Our Old Testament lesson today comes from the prophet Isaiah, near the end of the book, which tells us that this part of Isaiah was probably written after the return from the Babylonian exile, when people are coming home and finding out it's not really home anymore. Beginning at chapter 64, verse 1. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways, but you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of iniquity. <clears throat> Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now, consider, we are all your people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Or, to put it another way, Jesus, take the wheel. This is the beginning of Advent for us. Advent, the time we are accustomed, I think, to thinking of as a sweet time, like the last weeks of preparing for the arrival of a baby. A time of nesting, preparations for the one we have been longing for, decorating, twisting a perfect silken ribbon into a beautiful bow. Except this longing tears at our lungs like smoke from a fire. This longing finds us sobbing at midnight and retching at dawn. This longing pushes us to demand the presence of an all-powerful God to fix it, fix it all, fix it now. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Do we mean it? Do we really want God to tear open the heavens? and appear in the glory that made Moses avert his eyes, that caused the Israelites to beg never again to be subjected to the tintinabulation of that awful, awe-inspiring voice like a thousand waterfalls and a million stars exploding. Do we want that? The German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer preached an Advent sermon, and he said, we have become so accustomed to the idea of divine love and of God's coming at Christmas that we no longer feel the shiver of fear that God's coming should arouse in us. We are indifferent to the message, taking only the pleasant and agreeable out of it and forgetting the serious aspect that the God of the world draws near to the people of our little earth and lays claim to us the coming of God is truly not only glad tidings, but first of all, frightening news for everyone who has a conscience. Are we sure 
We want God to tear open the heavens and come down? Do we really mean it? Isaiah meant it. The people for and whom Isaiah spoke to meant it. They had nothing left to lose, you see. And as terrifying as the day of the Lord would be for them, for any sane person who starts to get a glimmer of what the presence of the Lord might truly mean, they had already seen greater horrors than they ever could have imagined. The occupation of their holy city, the ransacking, defiling, and destruction of their holy place, the temple, the killing or carrying away into exile all their leadership from kings to priests to scribes to military commanders, and the carrying away of nearly all the people into exile themselves. Then, returning a generation later to what was supposed to be home, but what did not feel at all like home any longer. The ongoing struggle to understand their own culpability in what had happened to them. And that question we try not to ask, but we can't help ourselves. Where was God? How could God let this happen? When you have nothing left to lose, that emptiness sometimes can become the hinge of the door that will open to your new life. And for Isaiah, for the people he spoke for and the people he ministered to, this was the pivotal moment. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Advent begins for us not in perfect, peaceful waiting by the fireside. Instead, it begins as a people on the edge, a people unsure, terrified maybe, of what is coming. And it begins with us as people ready for God to do it, to tear back the veil between what is and what God's preferred and planned future will be. When we reach the limits of our own abilities, that sometimes is the moment when we can finally understand what it is to be human. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our father. You are the potter and we are the clay. I can tell you with complete certainty that I have never in my life had an interest in becoming clay. I had a bunch of conversations with Sue Troy this fall about this very Sunday, and they all centered on the notion that perhaps she could bring her potter's wheel here and throw a pot while I preached. <laughs> Alas, no. One, Sue had a long planned trip, so. But two, the work of a potter is more complicated than I know. And three, a potter, when they've decided a vessel isn't what they want it to be, take decisive action. Oh, and by the way, a potter's wheel is about the size of our baptismal font, heaven, heaviness speaking. So Sue wasn't going to bring that, even if she was in town. The potter takes decisive action. They don't explain to the vessel what's going to happen next. They don't say, don't worry, you won't feel a thing. <laughs> they don't try to tweak that pot in small increments. They smash it. They smoosh it. They beat it down until it is once again a lump of clay, much like the one I had in my hand this morning. But now it is something the potter can work with again. It sounds absolutely terrifying, you know, from the clay's perspective. Here's where Bonhoeffer's sermon takes a turn. He notes, only when we have felt the terror of the matter can we recognize the incomparable kindness. God comes into the very midst of evil and death and judges the evil in us and in the world. And by judging us, God 
comes to us with grace and love. God makes us happy as only children can be happy. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our father. You are the potter, and we are the clay. This is a statement of complete confidence and complete humility, both at the same time. Humility because we are clay. We are clay crying out for God to intervene. And we know that intervention may well take the form of changing not just our situation, but us as well. This is the conventional wisdom about prayer, of course, that our prayer doesn't change God, it changes us. Prayer, too, is an act of humility. But this is also a statement of confidence, because this particular potter is also our creator, our father, our mother, the one who gave us birth, who formed us in our mother's womb. Doesn't a mother remember her nursing child? Doesn't a father run to welcome the prodigal home? Tear open the heavens, God, because we've got nothing left to lose except our misguided notions that we can hold it all together, we can fix it all ourselves, and we can bind up our own wounds. Wouldn't it be relief to let God be our hope instead of our own devices and desires? Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. Other things that happen when we get to the end of our rope. In addition to turning to God, we turn to God's most miraculous creations, one another. I was looking up a book by Brene Brown on the Amazon website the other day, and I scrolled down the page to read the reviews. And the first review was not a book review at all. It was a confession. It was one of the most heartbreaking things I have ever read. Tears came to my eyes while I was reading it. Among other things, the author said, I decided five years ago that I was done with fitting in, that I'd rather be lonely and alone than to continue immersing myself in a world I found caustic. The author, and I have no idea whether it was a woman or a man, described their withdrawal from the world in heartbreaking terms. Everywhere they had looked, they had seen anger, unkindness, and casual cruelty. They had decided to stand alone and had done so for five years. And instead of feeling better, they found themselves in a world of pain, except now there was no one to even share that pain with and no one to help them find out if there was another way. Isolating ourselves is easier than ever. That place, Amazon, that used to just be a bookseller, you can get your groceries from there now. You can get your electronic devices and all your entertainment and medical equipment and running shoes or bedroom slippers. It's entirely possible today to live as if we are completely alone in the world and just avoid the inevitable pain of human interaction. But then we would be in the inevitable pain of deep isolation. And we would be forgetting that God puts us in community every chance God gets. God places us in families for good and for ill sometimes and lets us learn the lessons of love one way or another. God places us in schools or maybe homeschooling groups and gives us opportunities to find friends or not. God leads us to churches or synagogues or mosques or party headquarters or community choruses. God places us in community because that is our very best chance of meeting God and being transformed by that meeting. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, for we are at the end of our ropes. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We can be the clay and cry out for God's terrifying and loving presence and salvation. 
We can be clay and let God fashion us into something beautiful. We can be clay and allow God to make us together into a hope-filled people, a community of caring. We can be clay, for God is our potter, and we couldn't be in better hands. Thanks be to God. Amen.